the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders said, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean who preached and did healings. Number three, Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followed as a movement. And finally, a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement, Galatians chapter 1, 13, 22, Philippians 3, 6. The persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34, E.P. Sanders, 1985, Jesus and Judea Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press. And just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community. Virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. Now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra, and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't beat, beat me in debate on this. I had a, a debate with DPR Jones, I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship, my arguments, and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly, academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently, John McDropout uh, took on the challenge for a debate, and I would actually love to debate him. And I've said I would debate him, and given him... Uh, I said to him that I would debate him. But when you have idiots ride into the city centre and try to film you, atheists, when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on, and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the China, uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture but basically the atheist community the skeptical community has not in any shape or form in any way dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence they have not dealt with presuppositions. They have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form. The best that they can do is quote Earl Doughty or a Richard Carrier or a Price. But there has been no in-depth debate and discussion on the issues that I brought forward. But there was a tacit running away from the skeptic and an endorsement of drama and cyberbullying against me. And the scholarship that I had to bring on this subject was completely ignored when people realized that, hey, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about, and if we continue to discuss with him, we're going to be educating people, and we don't want them to be educated in the kind of scholarship that this guy is going to bring. And so I was excluded from the conversation.
So, so we'll look at some of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, first of all, the four Gospels can be early first century and can be shown to be of eyewitness material. I could go on and on and on of the litany of information here. Uh, if you want to get a general outline, um, you can look at Wallace's paper on uh, tracing the eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, back to the first century as a very popular look at. But you can find that the four Gospels can be traced back to the early first century and traced back as eyewitness material. From a historical point of view, that's pretty amazing. You, you don't normally get that kind of quality information on a topic. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, uh, but we'll just mention 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, in his letter on the Gospels and other New Testament books. Basically, it's over 19,000 times the early church fathers quote from the Gospels. You can look at the Didache teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Prayer. That puts them, the Gospel to 95 AD. Uh, Matthew's quoted in 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the life witnesses were around. Scholars that believe that the Gospels are from an early date are John W. Wainham, Professor of New Testament Greek, Berg Gerdesen, Swedish scholar, Professor at Lund University, Marcel Jaus, a French Biblical scholar, Karsten Peter Thied, German papyriologist. You want to look at the more popular level, look at the early eyewitnesses of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. Ignatius letter to Trillian uh, in 9.4 we read Jesus Christ was of the stock of David who was from Mary he was truly born eight drank was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate was truly crucified and died who also was truly raised from the dead his father raising him what does this that, that's www.earlywritings.com Ignatius what, what does this evidence prove about the Gospels and the early church fathers here well first of all it proves that the Gospels are first century documents secondly it proves that these Gospels were authoritative and thirdly it proves that these Gospels had a general historical narrative that is consistent across the board uh, and and can be compared to other data which confirms that this is highly unlikely uh, it was an invention. If this story of the death and resurrection of Christ is consistent for a variety of documents in the second century and in the first century, it gives you a clear indication that those events took place. Secondly, the nature of the Gospels the, the Gospels text are historical, historically reliable. Now here is an important debate that I had with some atheists such as Thunderfoot and Ozzy and all the rest of them. And the kind of laughable arguments that they would use where Thunderfoot would say that comics can have historical facts in them but it doesn't mean that Spider-Man rose from the dead or whatever. Well first of all the Gospels are a particular genre of literature. Comics are a particular genre of literature. Comics are comics. Everybody knows what a comic is. The Gospels are a particular genre of literature. So right off the bat, people like Thunderfoot and Ozzy, 
need to reconsider their silly arguments. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. Luke is basically saying, look, I'm writing a document of history here based on eyewitness material. That's the genre of the literature. So when skeptics kind of come and say, oh, well, you're going to present facts to prove that the Gospels are historically reliable, but that doesn't prove Jesus rose from the dead. What it proves is the underlying textual base of the Gospels is reliable. And it shows that the writer and had integrity and it gives strength to their testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. So it actually is a very important plank of the debate and argument and cannot be dismissed as easily as Aussie and Thunderfoot did uh, prior to Christmas. So there are many historical facts. There are countless facts in the Gospels that have been confirmed. I could go on and on and on. Uh, the pool, the uh, in John chapter one forty four uh, in Bethesda, there is talk about fishing in that area, uh, but fishing implements in a house in Bethesda. Now you might say, well, why is that important? It's showing that the Gospels are historically accurate when they talk about the culture. Minor details that are mentioned in the Gospels, if they're confirmed in history, shows you that there's an intricacy there that you cannot get by fiction. In John chapter 2, verse 1 and 11, they found uh, storage uh, storage where uh, storage pots just like you see in the story uh, in Canaan in John chapter 2 verse 1 and 11 Pool of Bethesda John describes it as near um, near the sheep gate the discovery of the pool shows beyond doubt John was right Tiberius John is the John identified the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberius getting the exact kind of language of that time in John 6 1 John 21 1 he got Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea in 4 BC AD 39, moved his house, as it were, his capital from Sephora to Tiberias in AD 24. So John gets the political times right very clearly. The Gospels talk about Pontius Pilate, we find an inscription about that. We the Gospels talk about Jesus going to the temple to discuss we find the very stairways where people taught and sat at the temple to discuss. We found a Galilean boat in Luke 5, 1 to 11, uh, archaeologically. And we even found maybe Peter's house in Mark 9, 1. Ron Wallard writes, almost all scholars now espouse this view.
So I could go on and on and on. Uh, if you if you read Craig Blomberg's um, book on um, the atrocity of the Gospels, um, you will find time after time after time the Gospels get it right historically. I've tried. I've gone into depth on the Quirinius census. Uh, by the way, if you want to look at that, if you look at my videos on Jesus, uh, uh, Cambridge Companion to Jesus. But the point is that um, there's countless facts verified in the Gospels, historical facts, and minor details that people who are making things up wouldn't get correct. And there has to be an acknowledgement that there is historical accuracy within the Gospels. Now, there has been an unbalanced, an, in, an, an injustice and an imbalance concerning the Gospels. Since Paul, a lot of biblical scholarship and historical Jesus studies was influenced by post-enlightenment thinking and was anti-church, and so believed that it should get behind the Gospels and get to the true source material. And it was to ignore the church's perspective on the Gospels. But what that did is it began to take apart intricately analyzing every bit and part of the Gospels, never accepting any of it as historically accurate. Now, because of the 1920s, when uh, Jew Jewish scholars wrote the lives of Jesus from a Jewish perspective, and that scholarship was discovered in the 1950s and 60s, it began to dawn on scholars that Rudolf Bultmann and the form critics were actually not correct in their assessment of the Gospels. Bultmann assessed that the Gospels were actually, uh, that the, he, he believed in Greek culture and that anything that was Jewish was not historically accurate. But because of the revival of Jewish scholarship in the 50s and 60s, Scholars realized Bultmann and the form critics were wrong that there was actually a Jewish context to the Gospels. What that did then, it made scholars realize there was actually more historical content within the Gospels than was given credence. My argument and, and contention against atheists and skeptics who would say that we look at the Gospels piecemeal, that is the historical method and that we look at every individual bit and assess it on its merits is not completely fair because we wouldn't do that with completely with ancient historians there will be some ancient historians that are generally accurate and will take large chunks of what they're saying as accurate because we know that they would generally go and investigate and they would generally be be fair with their sources. We might be spot various biases, we might be able to spot indiscretion or compromises or whatever, but we'll have a general trust of an author or not. And I think the in injustice with the Gospels is since the Enlightenment there was an utter radical skepticism. And I think that Pendulum, that, that legacy is with us today and I think it has to change. I think there has to be a much more readiness to accept from the skeptics and from academics that the Gospels are generally trustworthy in the historical information. And if that's the case, it means you should be much more open to the data that is given about Jesus' miracles and about the resurrection. So it's a case of do you take a skeptical position or do you take a more of innocent till proven guilty? And I think the fair option in looking at the gospel documents is to say innocent till proven guilty rather than the radical skepticism that many skeptics use it's just a, a complete unfairness to the fact that we are finding continually the gospels as being accurate 
historically. That's a very important point, a nuanced point in this debate on did Jesus rise from the dead. It is true to say that we look at detailed historical data on their own terms, but it is also true to say that there are some writers that we know are more trustworthy than others. And so the question has to be up, as we look at the detailed information, are these writers trustworthy or not? That has to be answered, and the skeptics quickly put that under the carpet and don't put it up for debate. Because if they did, if the evidence goes one way, it means it's the end of the debate for the skeptic. Now, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels, we can compare the difference between the four Gospels. And we can find that when the Gospels mention, um, for example, in contrast, we find the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned at all. Galilee comes only once in the Gnostic text. As for biblical Gospels, Pilate appears about 60 times. And I could go on and on and on about more information about that. So the Gnostic Gospels show that they have no real historical integrity whatsoever. Then finally, we find that the Gospels are rooted in eyewitness material. Richard Balcom says, it is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the gospel, gospel traditions were connected with the name and known eyewitnesses, people who had heard the teaching of Jesus from, Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory, people who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death, resurrection, and themselves had formulated the stories about these events that they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remain throughout their lifetime.